So hello and welcome everyone to this online discussion on um, data for public good in times of pandemic, open data practices in Asia and Europe. Thank you very much for your patience. I think there's still a few people in the waiting room, but they're coming in slowly. Um, I'm Leila al -Zubedi. I'm the director of Heinrich Bell Foundation's uh, Hong Kong office, and we are very proud to jointly host this um, seminar with the Internet Society Hong Kong chapter. Many thanks to Benjamin Cho and his colleague Stacey Tsui, and also to my colleague uh, Lucia Siu for putting this together. Um, Internet Society Hong Kong is known to many of you um, for many interesting online events on internet and data governance. Uh, it works um, towards the vision that the internet should be an open and accessible network beneficial to society and it's a voice um, here in Hong Kong for internet professionals, users and the community at large. Um, the Heinrich Bell Foundation has begun working from Hong Hong Kong only this year. We are a German green think tank and we aim um, to provide platforms for exchange between Asia and Europe, especially between experts and civil society. And this is the third online event in our tech and COVID-19 series, which is um, essentially a collection of articles on global digital trends during the pandemic. And that's a project that we implement together with our offices in Washington DC and and Brussels. My colleague will put um, the link in the chat. And two of uh, our speakers today have written articles for this series, um, Benjamin on open data in Asia. And Eileen's article on how to use data for the public interest has just went online a few minutes ago. So please check them out. Um, I would like to make everyone aware that this event is being live streamed on the Facebook site of Internet Society Hong Kong and that it will be recorded and made public. And uh, we will mute the audience until um, the Q&A session. So if you have questions already now, please type them in the chat. Um, we will speak about open data practices in regional comparison. And I would like to start by introducing our speakers. Um, our co-host Benjamin Jo is the researcher for the Hong Kong Open Data Index, a research and advocacy initiative implemented by the Internet Society Hong Kong. And he will assess uh, the balance between open data and data privacy from an Asian context. Uh, Glenn Mile works for the Web Foundation's Open Data Lab Jakarta, where he leads research, capacity building and innovation projects. And he will discuss the efficacies and limitations of open data limitations during the pandemic for developing Asian countries using Indonesia as an example. And last but not least, Aline Blankertz is project director at Data Economy at Stiftung Neue Verantwortung, which is an independent um, think tank in Berlin, Germany, that specializes on the governance of digital and technological change. Um, she will talk about how health data becomes more accessible during COVID-19 despite privacy concerns in European contexts. We're very happy to have you today. Thank you very much for sharing your time and your insights. And before I hand over to our speakers, let me just very briefly summarize the topic today. Um, not only has the COVID-19 pandemic generated a massive volume of data, but it has also put data sharing much higher on the agenda and therefore ignited new discussion around open data. Uh, we are much more aware than ever that we need information in order to stay healthy and safe. And in many places around the world, citizens demand this information in real time. But um, with the heightened efforts to monitor the health, mobility and social behavior of citizens, concerns uh, about data privacy and democratic participation and the decisions about which data to make public have also increased. Um, here in Hong Kong, for example, it seems that we're hitting the, the fourth wave of infections now. And we're in the middle of a discussion about whether it will become mandatory that citizens scan a QR code before entering a cab or a venue and how the data collected in the process will be protected. What is open data? Essentially, it is the idea that non-personal data should be open and free to use and share and where creators and innovators are fairly recognized and rewarded especially relevant to the debate um, around open data is in how far governments are making 
data accessible for citizens and civil society so that they can make use of it for accountability, for innovation, social impact, and many other, um, many other um, goals. Different instruments are used to assess how good or bad governments are at this, like the Global Open Data Index, the Open uh, Data Barometer, and others. So what are the contentious issues here? Um, which data should be open and which should not? Also, what are the issues from the perspective of developing countries, where not only privacy might be an issue, but where the collection and quality of data and the data literacy among citizens pose their own challenges? And finally, do open data concepts and practices differ from region to region, such as between Asia and Europe? For example, when we think of um, public service, um, surveillance, social control, and stigma, what are the requirements for open data to be helpful without causing any harm? Um, this is just a quick summary so that we are more or less on the same page about what we're going to, um, going to talk about today. And we will start the discussion with the two inputs from Asia and then move on to Europe. After the inputs, we will open for um, Q&A with our audience. So please type your questions into the chat or raise your hand later. And when you ask a question, please introduce yourself or indicate if you wish to remain anonymous. And with that, I hand over to Benjamin. Uh, thank you, Laila. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Benjamin Zhou from Internet Society Hong Kong chapter. So I will start from uh, sharing the situation in East Asia first. Uh, let me share the, my uh, slides. Here we go. So um, the reason why uh, I shared the uh, situation in East Asia, because um, uh, our Internet Society Hong Kong chapter launched a new project called uh, Hong Kong Open Data Index in May this year. Um, it's a project basically about open data in Hong Kong, but uh, while developing the index, we also uh, research uh, massively uh, on the uh, open data, the best practice in, on open data in the neighboring region, which is the East Asia, in particular the advanced economies in East Asia. So we uh, collect quite a few information about how they uh, open up data in particular uh, when uh, during the COVID, uh, COVID pandemic. So I would like to take this opportunity to share with you all. So uh, let me start from where I live in Hong Kong. Uh, if you want to uh, know the data about COVID, uh, official data, you can go to a, a government website. There is a dedicated website for COVID-19 and there is a dashboard that you can see the visualization of the uh, COVID situation up to date. Um, if you want to have a complete list of the data about the situation, actually you can go to a uh, government portal, an uh, open data portal, uh, which is the data.gov.hk. You can have uh, quite a lot of different lists. Uh, for example, you will have um, the detail of individual cases. Uh, you can see their, the age, gender, um, if they are at hospital or discharge. And you can also see um, uh, the buildings where it has been visited by uh, uh, infected uh, persons and also uh, others like the fly, cars, uh, a ship that had, has uh, carry uh, infected person. So uh, you, you can find a lot of information about COVID in, um, released by Hong Kong government. Um, similarly, in South Korea, in the capital, uh, Seoul, um, the government also released a lot of such information uh, on their uh, government website, uh, of course, in Korean. Uh, but even though you don't understand Korean, you can see there's a column uh, that you can see the date and time slot. And there's another column that is pretty much empty. So I just uh, simply use Google Translate to see um, what are they. Um, and you see that uh, actually, sorry. And you see that, oh, okay, the, the time and day is that this person um, been to some place as a specific time slot, but the government omit the exact address of this place. 
Um, you may know that uh, in South Korea, the government used the contact tracing measures to know the people's whereabouts to track the COVID. So actually, the government has a lot of information about us. So, um, and actually, if you are diagnosed as infected, the government will send an uh, alarm to people who live in your neighborhood to tell them, be careful, somebody uh, infected in your neighborhood. So they have the data and they share to extend, but to protect privacy, they omit like detail like the address. And also you don't know who is it, you only see the number. And similarly in Singapore, they also use a lot of contact uh, tracing measures, uh, combining data from your, uh, your self-reporting data and the uh, credit card record, the uh, uh, cell phone usage and others. So um, you can see from also from the government portal, you can see a lot of details uh, about these places uh, which has been visited by um, an uh, uh, infected person at a specific time slot. So this is the information in Singapore, but of course you don't know, they will not tell you exactly who have been there for the privacy concern. And in Japan, they uh, use less contact tracing measures than uh, Korea and Singapore. Um, but in, they also uh, share a lot of information uh, similarly in Hong Kong, in particular uh, in the early stage of the outbreak. Um, you can see they uh, review each individual case. You can see uh, one of the, uh, a few of the early cases are imported from Wuhan, China. Uh, but they stopped sharing this individual data from uh, uh, Febr end of February. But on some occasions, for example, uh, those who are diagnosed as infected during the airport quarantine, they also they still tell you uh, some of the details, individual details. But uh, other than the individual information, there are also some other information that is valuable to help us to fight COVID. Uh, for example, the availability of the mask. Uh, for example, in Taiwan, uh, the government uh, released uh, this uh, information, up, uh, this real-time information on its open data platforms, uh, in particular at the early stage uh, when there was a shortage of mask and people need this information desperately. Um, so this information was updated uh, every few seconds. So uh, after uh, talking about all these measures, you may ask why this government um, share a lot of information, this Asian government, they share this information. Um, based on my observation, it's because there is a huge demand for this data, in particular at the early stage of the outbreak of COVID from uh, the people, because they are anxious about the situation. They want to know what's going on. So um, to answer these demands, all these authorities um, keep a high degree of transparency, release a lot of this data, in, even at individual level, uh, and such a great uh, granularity. So um, in, after release this data, and actually uh, all this, a lot of civil society groups make use of this data to keep the public better informed. For example, you see the left side is uh, dashboard created by civil society groups in Hong Kong. And the right side in Taiwan, there are more than a hundred apps uh, helping you navigate the uh, pharmacies to buy the mask. So in terms of this, this data uh, really helped us to fight copy uh, to in particular to remind us to take the precautions in the early stage. But um, there was a side effect. So we can see one of the biggest challenges is the privacy concerns. And to some extent, this privacy um, concern may jeopardize our efforts to fight COVID. For example, we have noticed that um, a typical case in South Korea, uh, there is a nightclub very popular among uh, LGBT, uh, LGBT group. And um, when there was an outbreak, uh, actually, a lot of people refrain from reporting 
uh, they have been there that night to the government because they are afraid that once the government knows the bang to the government will uh, send the notice to people in their neighborhood and they are afraid that identify they are they are afraid of the stigma they uh, uh, by releasing their uh, real sexual orientation so that's the concern uh, in, in South Korea and also uh, in other places um, uh, for the time comes through, I could not uh, detail uh, every cases. So um, for example, uh, after this, um, actually a lot of government have to adjust their measures to make a balance between the demand from the public for information and also the privacy. And you can see in uh, the SOAR government um, uh, from October, this year, they stop sharing all these personal information about such as the sex, age, nationality, place of residence, and et cetera. So um, they do make some effort to do the mitigation. But um, so my share is coming to the end. I don't want to uh, talk about too much about uh, my uh, my conclusion over this, we want, we want to open to a uh, discussion later, but I just want to raise the question I observed in the data sharing during the pan, uh, COVID. So in the COVID data, we have noticed that uh, actually it's a lot of these governmental measures are governed by different policy subjects, for example. When people ask for information, they uh, the government obliged to release information uh, due to uh, their access to information regime. There's a law required them to keep uh, some degree of transparency to tell people what's going on. And at the same time, um, the open data uh, initiative they have been practicing in the past few years allowed them to share the data uh, promptly. And when we talk about contact tracing, when we talk about the government know a lot of the detail of our whereabout, it's actually the big data we have been talking about in the past many years. So, and at the same time, um, a lot of civil society groups make use of the data. So all these skills to make use of data, to make value, is about data literacy among the citizens. So the other side is how to protect our privacy and safety of data. We have privacy law, and we also have the technology to prevent our data from being hacked, from being leaked. But you see that when the government implement that, these measures, they uh, make it um, piecemeal which means like when the government people require this data to release data and they say, oh, there's a privacy concern. So then they suddenly adjust the measures. But when we face this, when we are in this new big data, new age, we actually have to have, have, to have think about it as a whole. We have to have a new, we may need a new measure to think about this. So this is my question so far. Uh, so I will end off my sharing now and you leave to uh, other speakers to share. Thanks. Thank you very much, Benjamin. Thank I you. think, uh, yeah, you've raised a lot of questions that we will address later in the discussion. Yeah. And, um, yeah. but now I would like to hand over to Glenn. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Laila. Um, also, thanks to for the organizer uh, for putting together this uh, wonderful event and also to the participants for taking the, the time to join us in, in this uh, discussion. So my name is uh, Glenn Mayo. I'm from the Web Foundation's uh, hub in, in Jakarta, where we are doing a lot of uh, work in the area of open data innovations focusing in Indonesia as well as in Southeast Asia. So for just for this webinar, I'm just gonna talk about uh, two key issues that uh, Laila uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, 
in terms of some of the challenges in, in open data implementation, the era of COVID uh, related to uh, the need to improve uh, data governance within the government institutions, um, also capacity building, as well as um, balancing uh, between data, the need for data transparency for innovations and also protections of individual privacy. Uh, so briefly related to um, the state of open data in Indonesia. So we have started the open data uh, basically programs in the country since 2013. And over the years, uh, as our research uh, from the Web Foundation Open Data Barometer show that uh, the country is improving, uh, but uh, the progress remains slow. So we have um, one of the most vibrant civil society engagement in, in Southeast Asia, if you look at the data, and uh, the, the, there is a strong engagement between civil society and also with the national government and, and sub-national government in implementing different uh, uh, initiatives of open data. There's also significant improvement in terms of open data implementations. We have more and more data available. However, we still have an issue, which is common issue within the uh, open data uh, implementation in most of the developing countries where we have uh, lack quality of data. Um, uh, and that lack of quality of data is, uh, is so further amplified um, with, with the COVID-19. So, um, so COVID-19, so in terms of uh, data availability, COVID-19 reveals some of the most pressing issue within data governance in developing countries, including Indonesia. And um, from our research doing uh, health data flow research in Indonesia, we have also found uh, several issues related to uh, data quality and also infrastructure that supports data quality in Indonesia. So if you can see here um, in terms of data flow uh, in Indonesia, so most of the health data is actually originated from the local level, which is the uh, health facility. Uh, it's, we call it Puskesmas here in Indonesia. And then the data is actually being sent uh, to the national, through the district, provincial, and then the, to the national government. However, you, you can see the data is being managed in silo between uh, by each of the programs with, with little coordinations across the programs. And that creates an issue with data uh, accuracy because there is many uh, source of data and also in terms of data timeliness, uh, because this process are taking so long, uh, sometimes it needs around 20 days to actually uh, update it, uh, all the natural data, which is something that uh, not acceptable in times of uh, pandemic. We've also found an issue with, with capacity building in terms of the staff at the uh, health facility level here in, in Puskas Mas where Besides, they, they need to do a health service uh, and perform health-related services. They also need to perform uh, data, data management related as well. So uh, some of these issues and Indonesian government uh, has already realized some of these issues and have enacted uh, a policy called One Data Policy aiming to improve data governance in Indonesia as well as the publications of open data. And um, to add to these regulations uh, based on our research before, we have also uh, have uh, provided some recommendations in terms of building data governance capacity at the local level, as I mentioned earlier. We have also few, there is an important to look and review the existing regulation concerning the tasks and the roles of 
the staffs so that are managing the data, which is data producers and data custodians. Uh, there are also some recommendations from our research in 2018 with related to uh, data standard and also ICT applications that can support uh, data collections, uh, store, storage, and also sharing process. And uh, this brings me to the second debate about, uh, about data transparency and also uh, uh, protections of uh, individual privacy. And as a country, I think uh, we have also, we have in a, we're still in a little learning process. Uh, some of these reasons is because uh, there is still low and lack realizations about the importance of uh, uh, personal data and data privacy. For example, a survey carried out by Indonesian Institute of Science uh, in March, which is just a few days after the first COVID-19 cases uh, was found in Indonesia, uh, showed that overwhelming uh, interest by the citizens uh, for the uh, for the personal information name addresses of the positive uh, COVID-19 patients. And uh, obviously uh, open data is important. It's important for enabling innovations. Uh, as a country, we are also uh, in, the, in the learning process on how to balance uh, between data transparency for innovation and also protecting uh, individual privacy. I think it is uh, it will be useful also through this uh, webinar to learn some of these experience uh, from countries in Europe in how they're managing uh, this, uh, this uh, or navigating these key issues. Uh, for the Web Foundation itself, we have uh, uh, lot of issues, some policy recommendations. Um, one of them is the uh, adoptions of privacy by designers approach, which is really critical, uh, where we are putting the users as a key uh, in, in sharing or using the private data. Uh, so just to conclude, we think that uh, privacy and uh, public health do not have to be at odds. and the strong privacy rules uh, enable data use in a more productive way. Um, thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to discuss this further. Back to you, Laila. Thank you very much, Glenn. Um, before we move on to Europe with Eileen, I think Glenn, it would be good if you could um, explain the concept privacy by design again. Um, because I think it's a really interesting concept and um, you just explained it very briefly. Maybe if you could just elaborate a little bit and then maybe just to ask the, the two of you, um, Benjamin and Glenn, I mean, Glenn, you, you presented this um, survey that 60% of the population in Indonesia is actually in favor of publishing personal data when it comes to COVID-19 infections, right? I think that's probably a big difference to Europe. I don't know, Eileen will probably speak about attitudes there later, but I'm, I'm, I'm almost sure that in Europe, it, it would only be a minority that would be fine with publishing personal data. And then when you think of the example that Benjamin um, cited from South Korea, the stigmatization of the LGBTI community, that's not publication of personal data, but it's basically pinpointing to certain places where you can almost deduct, you know, who these people are, um, then it doesn't really matter anymore whether their names are being revealed, you kind of, you know, you, you kind of open up for stigmatization of a certain group. So how does civil society deal with issues like that? Um, in South Korea, there's a vibrant civil society. In Indonesia, you, you said, Glenn, there's also a very vibrant civil society. If the majority of people in Indonesia, Indonesia says, no, it's okay to publish our personal data, how do you advocate for, for privacy rights in such a context? Is it a matter of education and more awareness, for example? Okay, uh, thanks, Laila, for the questions. I think uh, just to respond to your last question, I think, uh, yes, I think, uh, like I said before, uh, 
as a country, we are still in the learning process and, uh, and in, in navigating between the importance of uh, data transparency for protecting public health um, and also um, between uh, protections of, of uh, individual privacy as well. Uh, there, there's still a lot of effort needed to uh, basically educate the uh, populations about the importance of individual uh, privacy. Uh, but while at the same time, uh, we'll be able to use uh, the data effectively that was provided as an open data for actually tackling some of these issues, uh, including on the health issues that we face right now. Um, yes, and, and also your question related to uh, pr privacy by design. I think that's the, the key principles that has been advocated as well in, in Europe. Uh, for sometimes they have, uh, so it has um, user center uh, kind of approach in terms of viewing uh, individual, uh, uh, sharing individual privacy data and, and, that, and where uh, those principles actually, uh, there are nine key principles in, in that uh, 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 privacy by design principle. Uh, such as proactive, not reactive, uh, uh, privacy by default, which is which is also a key, and uh, looking at the feasibility and transparency for and 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 also respect for user privacy. So some of those foundational principles are the key uh, for the privacy by design uh, principles, and uh, the. Recommendation that I've just shown you from uh, our organization actually be, uh, 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 basically based on those key principles uh, on how uh, we treat uh, the uh, personal or private uh, personal data uh, uh, and during the uh, pandemic as well. So yeah. Thank you very much, Glenn. Benjamin, would you also like to weigh in? Uh, sure. Uh, I also see the question asking to me, shall I just now or later in the discussion and uh, in the chat box? Yes, I think yes, because it's about your PowerPoint. Sure, sure. I think maybe you can answer that right now so that sure, we sure. avoid in unclarities. Yeah, let, let me uh, adjust. Uh, both questions. Um, so first of all, back to this uh, very specific question regarding to PowerPoint. Uh, uh, so it, it asks if like, uh, I'm talking about the, the building numbers and uh, for each cases and uh, uh, how, how is it the website, uh, how is it? Are uh, this kind of data uploading on the website until now in terms of privacy? How does Hong Kong government take into consideration? Uh, let me, uh, let me a little bit elaborate about this. Um, I think and uh, when there was outbreak in uh, the end of January uh, and early uh, February, I think the, the government immediately uh, released a lot of uh, individual data and, and because uh, like people keep asking uh, for the transparency. So they, they immediately uh, announced the list about uh, uh, a person at what age, what agenda, and, and what day is infected, and where he or she live in which building, uh, where he or she has been. But um, after a few days, um, they, they suddenly realized that uh, it's, these people will be identified and face stigmatization. Um, so I think they separate the list to different lists. So they just tell you that uh, how many people there. So basically who are uh, um, uh, just the gender and the age and that's it. And, but, and they prepare a separate list of the buildings that uh, infected patients have, have been to, uh, to remind people that if you have been to these places, be careful, or you should report to the government that uh, maybe you need some tests or something. Uh, I think after that, um, these places, and are not associated with a specific person, but 
from time to time, we still uh, hear uh, some of the news uh, about like some people are identified uh, as uh, infected patient, but usually a uh, high profile persons on the news. Um, well, in terms of uh, Lila's questions just now, I think this is interesting uh, culture thing that uh, in Asia, uh, generally privacy is a lesser concern <laughs> compared to uh, Europe. Of course, uh, we have uh, even like the case, uh, the example I made just now, like Singapore and Hong Kong, we, we pretty much have a robust privacy law there. But in terms of the culture, uh, in terms of the people in the civil society groups, um, um, they're, they're less resistance and to that um, the government releasing um, data and the individual, individual level. And, but on the opposite, they want to know more. And it, let's say if at the early stage, if you don't release the, the data, people won't Pro, definitely would go protest, say your your government you're holding on something. But on the opposite, if like you release too much, too information, I don't see there is um uh there are civil society group uh, advocating privacy, but I don't see there will be, will be a big campaign to advocate this. I think that's an interesting observations uh, in terms of a culture. I don't want to take up too much time to yeah on, on this, but I think that's uh, my observation so far. We can talk about this uh, in terms of how to govern the situation later. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you, Glenn. Okay, then um, we move on to Europe. Eileen, the floor is yours. Yes, thanks a lot. Uh, and just give me one sec because the yeah, here we go. Um, well, th thanks first of all for inviting me and already thanks a lot to Benjamin and, and Glenn for those many insights about the Asian experience. I mean, as you already hinted at, the European experience has indeed been different, um, but I think we really ha don't have any final answers on where to strike um, the balance between data openness and data privacy um, either. So I think it's, it's, it's very helpful to, to have this um, dialogue. Well, and as you already said, I'm, I'm gonna talk about the European experience. Um, I'm based in Germany, so potentially a little bit biased in that direction of kind of the more privacy focused um, in, environment. But um, yeah, I, th I think it's, 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 it's good to show that we have a pretty, pretty broad spectrum here as well. But before diving into this, um, I just wanted to remind all of us that when we talk about open data, we actually often refer to a lot of different things. So um, traditionally, what most people are referring to when they talk about open data is what we see here in the top left corner of the metrics. Uh, which is government data that is fully open. And so the idea is kind of they have some kind of um, non-personal data kind of about, for example, democratic processes or, um, or um, gov government organizations, which you can just make available. Um, and in this case, I think the, the best analogy is for with, you know, just case numbers. Of COVID-19. Of course, you can also you, you get to a certain privacy dimension if you become sufficiently granular. And here in Germany, there was some guidance that kind of the reporting had to stop. Um, kind of the or the most granular it could get was a hundred people. So you could say, for example, for a specific street or so, um, if how, how many infections there were, if you had at least a hundred people. In, in, in an entity. Um, but there's also data that has been shared by uh, non-governmental organizations. So it's kind of private data, if you wish. Um, but it's then been made sure that it's not really uh, private anymore by aggregating it. And we'll come back to that in, in a second um, because a lot of um, uh, researchers have looked into the impact and efficiency of social distance, distancing measures 
using GPS data from mobile phone companies. But then you, where I think we've actually seen even more movement is not in the kind of in complete openness of data, but in learning how to share data selectively. So um, we've seen a lot of speeding up in sharing data between governmental entities to make sure that the financial support necessary to, to help businesses during COVID-19, well, that, that, that was really sped up and what was made more efficient. Of course, there's still a lot of room for improvement, but um, this was really important for a lot of entrepreneurs or large and, and also large businesses that they could file the applications quickly, provide data about their, their, um, their revenues and then get, get some, some compensation. Um, and then there's also a lot of, well, data sharing happening in, in the context of contact tracing. Um, and that's the one that I want to um, focus on a little bit more on the next slide. So basically the, the whole point of contact tracing is to um, be able to target policies more. So that if you have limited, um, limited resources in testing and you don't want to put everybody, you know, to make everybody stay inside, um, contact tracing can help governments focus their policies on specific people. But the question is how to actually make sure it's done in a, in a good way that doesn't harm privacy. And there are two characteristics that we really um, found were widely adopted across Europe. The first is that um, governments made the use of contact tracing apps voluntary. There, there's no, no government um, that we know of that has made this mandatory Obviously, this is difficult because not all smartphones um, have the right specifications and well, people can in theory also always leave their smartphone at home. But there was a debate about this and kind of we came out uh, at the end with the uh, more or less consensus that it's important to explain to people why this is important and then let them decide and, and understand the benefits. And that's related to the second point that um, it's understood that there's stig stigma that comes with a, with a positive test result. And I think this is actually some, a lot we learned from the Asian experience and also from, from, the, from, from the Korean case from the LBGTQ community. Apart from that, there, there, there was quite a bit of fragmentation across countries. So in, in March and April, we had a quite intense debate about whether those contact tracing apps should have a centralized or a decentralized um, approach, especially also here in Germany, it was quite a lot of big and force with just a lot of experts coming out in favor of a decentralized approach. And this is where most countries, but really not all of them, um, settled in the end. Uh, and decentralized means that no, the, the contact data isn't sent to a, central, to a central server, but it's uh, really kept uh, locally so that only when there is an infection, kind of that data is encrypted, sent to a central server so that kind of everyone else can check whether they have been in contact with that person without actually knowing who that person is. But well, as I said, France went down a different route and also the UK only very recently um, decided to, to go decentralized. But what we saw in any case is that contact tracing isn't a silver bullet, but it has to be kind of part of a wider set of measures. Overall, in any case, we learned that people are wary about sharing the data with public entities, possibly even more wary about than, than about sharing it with with private companies who use that data. So government, as a consequence, most governments decided not to use any active monitoring of smartphones to enforce quarantines. One, one exception is Poland, where people had to take one selfie each hour and send it to, to the health ministry to basically show that they were staying inside. But we saw quite a lot of divergence in terms of tracing in 
in, in, in restaurants and other public spaces. So let me just briefly um, tell you a little bit more about the data that has been opened up by organizations in the first instance. So I already mentioned the GPS data, which has been aggregated to, um, to check how local, how um, social distancing worked. And what you see here in Italy um, at the bottom is that actually, even before there was a lockdown, a lot of people, especially in the, in the regions that were most severely affected, already decided to move around a lot less um, and that effect became more pronounced over time until you see on, 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 on the third picture, uh, a national nationwide lockdown was imposed. But, it, uh, well, there was some criticism towards the mobile phone companies who in, in, in many European companies donated, uh, donated that, com that data to, to public um, entities. But it's generally, I think, we haven't heard of any stories where that was used for, for adverse purposes. And similarly, um, European uh, governments has, have also gotten together to support this COVID-19 data portal, which is mainly to connect medical research and make sure that research efforts aren't duplicated, but actually built on each other to reach conclusions, which can then guide policy uh, more quickly. And the final bit is, well, actually the, the hardest one, because ideally, if you want to uh, want, want privacy and there's also this, you know, whole user centric aspect to, to be put into practice, you have a user a, a kind of efforts led by individuals. Um, and that's um, something which you've seen in some cases here on the right hand side, you see an application that has been developed by a, a German research institution and um, where fitness tracking data was shared and then analyzed. But also they were criticized because they weren't considered transparent enough and because they didn't really publish enough results. But again, kind of if you wanted to re be respectful of privacy, there's kind of a little bit of a question how how um, granular can those results actually be without um, raising concerns as well? And the, we already had a debate before COVID-19 about how to better use um, health data, but this has really um, be become much more prevalent right now because people have been become aware of the risk of misuse, but they also know the potential a lot better now. And one specific example, which is really being um, discussed at a high level, so it, it uh, is the, um, the idea of data altruism, where which might become part of the EU Data Governance Act fairly soon. And the idea is really to develop more mechanisms um, such that individuals can decide to share data about them in order to give other entities uh, which ideally act in their best interest to, to use the data and perform analysis um, that then may, may be shared also to, to the wider public. The EU is, can, can just stimulate that. They can't really do it themselves. That's up to, to each member state on its own. Um, but I think it's very interesting and very promising that we are, this debate is picking up and um, it's probably going to take some more time until we have some, some solid mechanisms in, in, in place here. Um, but I think that's you know, putting the individual at the center while making it at the same time easy for them to, to make effective decisions. It's really um, a, a good way forward to uh, properly um, reconcile data openness and privacy. So thanks a lot and I look forward uh, to the discussion. Yeah, thank you very much, Eileen. It sounds like a very interesting concept, data altruism. It will also tell a lot about, um, about the trust levels of citizens, right, in private corporations or in governments, um, if they're ready to release their data. Um, we have questions in the chat that I will read to you. 
And if anyone is raising their hand, I cannot see everyone, then I would ask Stacy maybe to help me. <laughs> so there is a question from Axel Hanai Sievers in Myanmar to Benjamin especially. In Myanmar, there was also an attempt to publish detailed case information with limited address information and without individual itineraries though. This worked a while until about September. But then the system of case tracking and public information about it seems to have collapsed as the number of new cases exploded. So open data was tried at the beginning but broke down under the pandemic dynamic and limited capacity to trace. Do other countries in Asia and beyond, so maybe the others can also comment on that, um, have similar experiences? Benjamin, would you like to address that? Um, yes, I think this is very interesting. Um, um, just now, I, uh, during my uh, presentation, you see that um, uh, these Asian governments, Japan, South Korea, Hong Kong, um, Singapore, they can um, share a lot of details about uh, individual cases in particular. Uh, I think uh, other than like um, uh, the privacy culture thing, I think um, one of the uh, important aspects is that um, there are much less cases in Asia. So it works if you share these individual cases. So as back to um, the, uh, the audience from Myanmar said um, that the authority trying to share uh, more detail, but when the cases grow exponentially, so it, it will break, I, I'm sure it will be the case if like um, the cases increase dramatically in even in some of the jurisdiction I mentioned, I think uh, you have to choose another approach. For example, in Hong Kong, um, usually every day it's, we only have less than uh, double digit numbers. Um, so yes, you can go to a lot of detail. We have press conference every day. There is a spokeswoman talk about each case one by one very detailedly. But once you reach the level of like 150, so it, it, it's impossible to, to go that far. So I think that's that's one of the reason we, um, we, we can do that. I think that's um, really depends of the situation now. It, it just like how we contain the, 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 the pandemic uh, when there's less case here, we, we, we just try to make it, uh, make our effort to zero. But when we reach some uh, another level, we will use another approach. Thanks, Benjamin. Um, there's a question from Stephanie Henke to Benjamin and Glenn. Um, we were talking mostly about contact tracing and response that happened in the past. Could you talk more about what you think will happen in the future? How else is technology being applied to mitigate the spread of COVID and or what kinds of technologies do you think will be put in place in Asia to stop a pandemic spreading again? For example, early warning. Hmm. Does one of you want to respond? Yeah, I can. Uh, yeah, then I can respond to the questions. Uh, just to, uh, I think, uh, I think we, we, when 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 we are talking about the technology, digital technology, uh, we have also seen um, in, uh, the uh, the big big data technology being introduced uh, for you know, not only for uh, uh, for the uh, past analysis, but also for predictive analysis as well. So we have look at. Uh, I think that that kind of technology will also be useful. And I think also not only for the tracing. I think in the in 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 the future and at at, at, at currently as well. Um, we have also seen some of the technologies like crowdsourcing. Uh, have been used for uh, getting, you know, more and more in information uh, regarding uh, the spread of a pandemic as well. So, you know, web crowdsourcing technology will also be useful in, in that sense. Uh, we have also seen some kind of pilot project here in Indonesia uh, implemented in local uh, community uh, 
to actually measure in real time the impact of a uh, pandemic, uh, something that uh, it's difficult to do uh, when you do, you know, like traditional survey, uh, for instance. So those kind of technology not only be useful for the tracing or prediction of the pandemic, but also looking at the impact of pandemic as well. And also just like to add to what uh, Benjamin has said uh, with response to Axel's question before. I think uh, in terms of you know, data governance uh, issues that I mentioned earlier, uh, it actually affects how the government uh, can basically can provide uh, real-time data. So I mentioned about infrastructures, I mentioned about lack of uh, capacity building at the uh, by the government staff who handles both uh, health services and also uh, data management. So that's good, that, that is also an issue. So so uh, the complexities uh, uh, triple and increasing when you are adding more and more or providing more and more uh, data to the public. Uh, which means uh, we can also see that in many of these countries, there's also limited uh, information related to the COVID, which is strictly uh, something related to positive cases, a uh, number of recovery uh, cases, and also maybe the number of uh, deaths in the, in the country. So it's, it's quite limited in, in some of these countries because um, Providing more data mean that we could we could be, we will also increase uh, complexity in 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 providing those data as well. I, I can quickly uh, respond to the questions. Um, um to me, I think <clears throat> um the presentation by Alain um, is quite inspiring because as you mentioned that. Uh, 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 disaggregate data of a contact tracing. I think that, um, to me, that might be the directions um, uh, instead of uh, individual level, because um, actually the interesting part is that uh, another, uh, a country I didn't talk about is the mainland of China, that um, they are using a lot of uh, this kind of, the, you can say, contact tracing technology, they call it uh, health code. So they use um, uh, combining a lot of data from different sources to uh, determine if you are uh, in a high, if you are high risk person or if you are low risk person, and then if you can go. So, um, in 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 um, in terms of um, the big picture, it's 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 good to use this data to analyze the risk of an area. But to the individual level, it's sometimes. Uh, uh, my uh, my observation is, is not necessarily worth. Sometimes it's uh, the 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 results was just wrong uh, based on the experience in China. And um, for example, in Beijing, there was this market that there there was an outbreak. So people some those uh, received the alarm saying you are you are at high risk, but actually they are they are actually they're far away from the market that they've never been to. So sometimes it is, it's, it's, we can't just rely on this, uh, this technology. We have to use other measures um, and we, we still have to be careful until uh, maybe one day uh, the technology go to that level become very accurate, but I, I don't see it at, at this moment yet. Thank you, Benjamin. Eileen, would you also like to um, comment on future technologies related to data? to prevent uh, well, spreads of yeah sure i mean uh, and maybe this also um talks to this i mean so someone terry graham is also mentioning the uh, apple google exposure notification framework um i mean first of all i think it's important to bear in mind that technology is not going to do the full job we still need proper um policies around that and kind of intelligent responses. And I think, I mean, to my mind, and it, I, it would be really interesting to look at this in more detail, to my mind, the reason uh, why the Asian response has been so much more effective than the European one is only very partly driven by the more privacy intrusive data sharing. But I think it's mainly about kind of generally people being, um, well, uh, 
I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit speculating, but, you know, people adhering to, to social norms more than some, I, I think here in people, I mean, Europe ha have, has never, or, well, the last time there was a pandemic, that's quite some time ago, so nobody actually remembers. So people were, I think, in the, in, in, in the beginning, not very, um, well, weren't quite sure how to behave. And I think that that, that has been a great, great advantage. And this question of, you know, how much do you actually gain by making the more detailed data available? I think that's an open one that's really interesting. And maybe we can learn something when we get, um, well, as, as time evolves in Europe, and maybe we can compare the effectiveness of the central versus decentralized um, contact tracing in, in a few months. So where this is heading, um, I hope that something like the, um, you know, the, the, the Bluetooth tracking, I think in general is a good start. You could also use other, um, other technologies such as, you know, which, which uh, Wi-Fi networks people are connected to without actually, you know, as in, in an encrypted way that would allow you to identify who has been close enough to someone else. Um, and I think that, I mean, Apple and Google are taking this forward is really, um, really powerful. At the same time, what I think we need to be concerned about is making sure that there is some democratic element in this because um, here in, in, in Germany, basically the, the announcement that Apple and Google would only support the decentralized contact tracing came really just a couple, I think a day or so before the decision of the German government to opt for the decentralized version. And it's not really clear how, kind of how, how one influenced the other. Um, and um, I think that's something where we have to, you know, still make sure that the technology responds to democratic needs. Um, but I think that we, we have learned a lot already, as I said. And I think this, you know, finding more ways to share data, you know, you know, share the right data that allows us to do kind of more precise contact tracing. Mm. While we, we learn that we don't have to infringe privacy as much, that's uh, an, a, a really promising direction. Thank you, Eileen. Um, there was a, a question by Terry Graham to everyone that you've already addressed, I think. Um, he wrote, speaking of technologies that could be put in place, can the speakers talk about the Apple Google exposure notification framework and the collaboration and how that will play out in Asia and Europe? Is there anything more that um, one of the speakers would like to say about this? Um, uh, I, I don't have any information about uh, the Apple Google exposure notification framework uh, in, in Hong Kong, so I can't comment about that. Sorry. Thank you, Benjamin. Then um, if Glenn, if you don't want to um, respond to this, then I would move on to the last question. Yeah, I think uh, I'll basically agree with uh, Helen has uh, with that so the, uh, you know, the the debate between decentralized versus decentralized. Uh, and I think in, in Asia, we, we will probably uh, we'll learn actually and we'll see what, uh, what transpired. Uh, there's also uh, an issue with data localization here in Asia where some countries requires data should be stored in in, within the country juris, jurisdiction, so it, it 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 will be interesting to see how this plays out um, in 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 different contexts, including Asia. Thank you, Glenn. We've actually already arrived at the end of our time, but since we started a bit earlier, I would um, like to give space for the last question that is in the chat. Um, it's from Axel again. Um, and addressed um, to Eileen specifically. I like the idea of data altruism, but how to promote this idea while the public narrative, in Europe at least, is dominated by defending my privacy and corporations steal my data. 
trust, of course, is a major issue, but public image also plays a role. Are there some beautiful examples of data altru altruism whose stories can be told to encourage people to become more open? Um, yes, fortunately, there are. Well, I mean, first of all, I would say people sh should still be a little bit wary. And, you know, we, we are at a stage, I think, where, when people are um, more reassured that they actually, you know, have um, have reasonable have a reasonable say in what happens with data about them. I think they would also be more willing to well then share it with entities um, they trust. And well, as I, as I said, there are not too many examples where this happened. But well, um, a couple which you know come come to the top of my mind uh, um, are come more from from the activist side, I would say, where um, individuals have requested data about themselves from big corporations to, for example, then reverse engineer or try to reverse engineer um, the scoring of a credit rating company. And, um, and the same happened with, you know, in individuals asking or combine then combining um, search histories to understand to what extent search results were personalized. And I, I think that kind of yeah, are very concrete examples where people actually wanted to get a specific, uh, the, the answer to a specific question. But we also see it in, in medical research. So for example, there are biobanks and also um, some uh, cooperatives where people actively cooperate um, to with medical data about them, they get information about how it is used and kind of how it is uh, made anonymous or at least pseudonymous. So it, it cannot be uh, linked back to them easily. And um, that, that I think the hope is that can drive uh, medical research. To be very honest, I haven't, again, kind of, I, I think that the debate would uh, benefit from more transparency about those results that we already have, especially medical research um, from those cooperatives would be great to see what actually happens with that data. Um, but then it's always chicken egg. You first need people to contribute data and then you can, can, can be more open about um, how it is used and what difference it can make in practice. Yeah, thank you, Eileen. Axel just wrote a comment. Um, also, many people happily donate computing power time or computing power or time to scientific projects, and they must trust those to whom they send their data. Okay, so a plaidoyer for trust from Axel from Myanmar. <laughs> Unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time. I also don't see more questions. Um, it's unbelievable how fast an hour passes. Um, I think the discussion has highlighted that we need many more of such conversations and dialogues. Um, a lot of issues were raised also about, you know, the cultural kind of susceptibility to, to open up your personal data or not. Um, the, the issues that Benjamin raised around policies and different policies that are applied to COVID-19 related information and data sharing. And all of these issues, I think we could um, we could fill another uh, um, another um, a seminar about that. Um, and I think, in, in also in summary, that the discussion has highlighted that the current crisis is really a challenge to this very very delicate balance between privacy and and publicity. But maybe it also serves as a reminder to the public to remain vigilant um, regarding decisions on on data governance, while at the same time generating new ideas of, on, on how to share data for the common good that are obviously necessary too. So I'd like to end with a quote that I read in a publication on, on open data today and I, I really liked it. Um, it says, data is a source of power and advocacy for open data is therefore a strategy to redistribute that power. Um, but of course, it needs the necessary infrastructure because we heard earlier when the system breaks down, then all good intentions regarding open data also break down. So we need we need both. 